As the 20th century dawned, Britain's sense of its role in the world had given it dangerous delusions about what it could do. World War and its aftermath would expose these delusions in a merciless fashion. The First World War stretched far beyond the mud and trenches of Northern Europe. It reached into the streets and deserts of Palestine and the Middle East. Once again, Britain feared for its key strategic asset, its lifeline to India, the Suez Canal. It had to be protected. The region was ruled by Britain's war enemy, Turkey. In their desert conflict with the Turks, the British needed allies. The Bedouin tribes of the Arabian desert knew this arid land and they knew how to survive in it. If they could be encouraged to rise up against the Turks, they might prove invaluable. But who could unite them? This is the edge of the Sinai Desert. It was here that a young man came on a secret mapping mission for the British Army. It was disguised as an archaeology field trip and it was the beginning of a long love affair with the desert and with the Arab people. That love affair created one of the most romantic figures in the history of the British Empire, Thomas Edward Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence, the illegitimate son of an Irish baronet, scholar, archaeologist, linguist, was just the man to charm and inspire the Arabs into a desert revolt. The story of an Englishman leading an exotic army across the desert caught the public's imagination. In contrast to the mud and murder of the Western Front, here was a sweeping campaign fought in blazing sunlight. And here too was a different kind of imperialist. Romantic, idealistic, dashing and slightly nuts. Lawrence had a passion for the Arabs and their way of life. His ability to live like them impressed them. So did the gold from the British treasury he brought to pay them. And he gave them something more, a belief in themselves as an Arab nation. As his masters in London had hoped, he coaxed them into fighting with the British with the promise of their freedom once the war was over. Do you think he was a good man? Yeah. Why? Uh, he was a real man, yeah. 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 He was a real Do you think that the promises that he made were ever kept? Lawrence 
Lawrence promised his Arab fighters freedom from foreign rule. They believed Palestine would be theirs. There would be many more promises made and just as many broken. The war in the desert finally brought Britain a string of heady victories. Imperial troops from India, Australia and New Zealand, as well as Britain, swept across the region. By the winter of 1917, the ultimate prize was within their grasp. The holy city itself. And so was born the dangerous conviction that the interests of the British Empire and the will of God might be one and the same. For Christians, Jerusalem was sacred as the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, venerated as the place where Christ's body was laid. But Jerusalem was sacred to other faiths too. A thousand years before Christ, it was the capital of the Jews. Sharing the city with the Jews in relative peace were the Arabs, for whom Jerusalem was one of the holiest cities in Islam. For the British Prime Minister Lloyd George, the empire now began to feel like a divine mission. Most British political leaders had been brought up on the Bible. They were steeped in its geography. And as for its history, well, Lloyd George claimed that as a boy he knew the names of the kings of Israel long before he knew the names of the kings of England. At noon on December the 11th, 1917, British forces entered Jerusalem. In a show stage managed from London for this imperial victory, the trappings of power were discarded. Commander-in-Chief General Edmund Allenby dismounted from his horse and entered the city on foot. To a watching world, Allenby was proclaiming that he came not as a conqueror, but as a pilgrim. Behind him, in borrowed army uniform, was a jubilant Lawrence. But his joy would prove short-lived. On the walls of the city, Allenby ordered a solemn proclamation from the British government to be read out. He knew, he said, that the place was sacred to three great religions, that its soil had been sanctified by prayer and pilgrimage, and he promised to preserve it. But for all his fine words, Allenby had been handed a ticking time bomb. For back in London, the British government had just gone even further. The Jews of Europe, scattered for centuries, had been made a remarkable offer. In the Balfour Declaration, the British Foreign Secretary committed Britain to helping the Jews make a home in Palestine. Playing God in the Holy Land was an astonishing gesture. The British had come to feel they were agents of destiny. They had become powerful enough and, you might say, well-meaning enough 
to believe they could solve the problems of the world. The promised land had now been promised once too often. Over the next decade, as more and more Jews arrived in Palestine, tension between them and the Arabs rose. It came to a head at the Wailing Wall in the heart of Old Jerusalem. In 1929, riots broke out here at the site sacred to both Jews and Arabs. The riots spread, and later Arabs murdered Jews in their homes. The British police were completely outnumbered, and the British authorities decided that from now on, all Arab outrages would be met with real aggression. The British want peace at any price. They try to restore order, search everybody. They act as if both sides are equally guilty. To the Arabs, the British had broken the promise of freedom made to them by Lawrence. Instead, the Arabs were having to give up their land to the Jews. The Jews felt the British were failing to honor the terms of the Balfour Declaration and the promise of a national home for them. Both sides made their case with Jelignite. Both sides committed appalling atrocities. Palestine became a posting from which many never returned. The Protestant cemetery on Mount Zion is full of British graves. Many belong to soldiers, policemen and civilians who died trying to keep apart two peoples who had previously lived relatively peaceably together. After a while, you begin to notice one date keeps reappearing. The 22nd of July, 1946. on the right of the picture that the terrorists placed their explosive. The hotel housed the British Army headquarters and the Palestine government offices, and casualties were very heavy. 91 people were killed, including 41 Arabs, 28 British, and 17 Jews. Sarah Agassi was 17 at the time. She was a member of the team of militant Jews who bombed the King David Hotel. Pretending she was just attending a dance, she scouted the hotel for the terrorists, deciding where the bomb should be placed. So they came down here with, yeah. the, with the bombs, and then, and then what happened? To their, to their place, I not, no, it's not here, there. Through there? Of course. It was open. Do you recognize it? Yeah, of course. We came from here. This was the place that you had been looking at when you yes. came dancing that day? Yes, here. Here was the bar, and here was the orchestra, and all this was very big, and we danced a lot of chairs and uh, tables, beautifully lamps, and everything was very beautiful. Now, wh where were the bombs put? Into this... Uh, 
columns. This is a, one of the columns that supports the whole hotel, I guess. Yes, or yes. this corner of the It's hotel. not one. One, two, three, but four, five. Five columns, five bombs. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you heard the bomb go off? What did you think? What did you feel? We were satisfied. You were satisfied? Yes. It's a, it was a mission. You've never been worried about what you did? Of course I was worried to, to succeed. In it. But you, you, your, your sense of morality, your conscience hasn't bothered no, you since? No, no. We, we, we fight for our, to have a Medina, to do something against the British. What do you think about it after all this time? This is over 60 years ago now. Have your views changed? No. No. Lama, there was a similar British here. So we took it in a similar British. Do you not feel any thanks at all to the British? I mean, without the Balfour Declaration, there would have been no Jewish homeland in this part of the world. The Gamaya interest shall be shall it hot malchuta liot poshalitim. Sure, the motive is neither here nor there. I mean, it, it, whatever the motive was, do you not think that the Balfour Declaration, the right of the Jews to have a homeland <laughs> in Palestine, it was a good start. That was a good thing, wasn't it? Yes. And are you not grateful for the British for that? It was now a lot less like the promised land than hell on earth. Tommy's go home someone daubed on a wall and beneath it a despairing squaddy wrote, I wish we well could. What Lawrence called the British love of policing other men's muddles had proved a disaster. The British Empire is gone from the Middle East, but everyone still lives with the consequences of Britain's presence in Palestine. Divided peoples and a divided land. The Middle East taught the British a lesson that all empires have to learn sooner or later. That though you may begin with ambition and come to believe you'll last forever, one day you will have a head-on collision with reality. In the end, and there is no disguising this fact, the British ran away. It was May 1948. One departing official commented bitterly, it is surely a new technique in our imperial mission to walk out and leave the pot we placed on the fire to boil over. British omnipotence had been called. It would be called again and again over the next few decades. The empire that had lasted more than 200 years would be dismantled in scarcely 20. The British were beginning to lose interest the battered country that emerged from the Second World War was more concerned with bettering the lives of its citizens than anything else. An American politician later remarked that the British people had decided they preferred 
free aspirins and false teeth to a role in the world. But it hasn't entirely turned out that way. In fact, we've done anything but climb into the back seat. The empire may be over, but imperial habits linger on. In the last three decades, Britain has embarked on seven foreign wars. There were arguments aplenty for fighting any one of them. But you can't help wondering if, without the memory of empire, Britain would have plunged in quite so readily. It's as if we can't quite let go of who we once were. Still to come, how Britain grew rich on profits from the drug trade and from the traffic in human beings. How it brought Christianity to Africa and the gospel of sport to the world. And next time, how British men and women made themselves at home in the far-flung colonies of empire. To order a free Open University poster exploring the legacy of Britain's empire, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash empire or call 0845 366 8021. Britain's most eminent scientist, Sir Paul Nurse, delivers this year's Richard Dimbleby Lecture on the subject of science tomorrow night at 10.35 on BBC One.